Well, good afternoon, good evening, and, and, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Harry Brelsford here with SMB Nation. It is, in fact, the weekly webinar. And uh, as always, a little bit of housekeeping up front. So first of all, midday in Seattle, uh, the cloud capital of the world literally today with the, uh, the weather we have. Um, the next couple of days uh, over on the East Coast, it's mid-afternoon, early evening in Europe, and extremely early over in Australia, and we have attendees from, uh, from all regions. So thank you, over 100 attendees today, great crowd. A um, couple of housekeeping things up front. So as we speak, uh, our Tour to Cloud workshop is occurring in Fort Lauderdale. So we have over 50 MSPs today doing a deep dive, a technical deep dive into Azure and Office 365 with Grant. Uh, Jenny's not on the webinar today because Jenny's awfully busy running that show. So they would have eaten lunch a little while ago and they're turning the corner on uh, wrapping up the day in about another two hours and then heading home to Seattle. Last week we knocked out three cities, three stages in California, San Diego, Irvine, and Sacramento. So it's just, it, it, it's, it's like a presidential campaign. It really is. Um, in two weeks we're in New York and Boston, followed by election week. How about that? Election week, we are in Dallas, Austin, and Houston. So it's all at Tour to Cloud. Tour to cloud com. Join us. Um, we're getting really good reviews on the, the fresh content that we have, and there's a hunger for Azure. Uh, be sure to sign up for the Sunday paper. If you're getting our Sunday paper, uh, smbnation.com, and at the bottom you can register for the Sunday paper. We have a little bit of breaking news this Sunday that I'll hold back on talking about because it is, in fact, breaking news. Um, with that said, that is kind of the housekeeping component. Be sure to use the question feature to ask your questions today. And uh, this is exciting that we have uh, some, some good friends and for scales here to talk uh, about their participation in the partner channel. This is a channel conversation today. So I want to hand it over pretty quickly to Derek and Chris. Uh, Gentlemen, good good after. I want to say good morning, but it's good afternoon. <laughs> hey there. Good afternoon. Good evening. So let's jump, Derek. Why don't we just jump right into it, my friend? All right. My name is Derek Wood. I'm the director of channel enablement for Infrascale, and I'm joined here with Chris Sturbens, our channel chief at Infrascale. And today we're going to go through. Uh, the channel's guide to ransomware and how your role in preventing such an epidemic is uh, going to help you help your customers and our recommendations for, for getting through that. Uh, as we go through, we will be giving out a prize at the end. So uh, within a week, we'll announce the winner. So send in questions and the partner with the most participation today will be the winner. And then I'll let Chris take us through the agenda for today. All right. Thank you, Derek. And thank you, Harry. It's great to be here. Uh, so today we're going to go through uh, the evolution of ransomware. It's been uh, it's in the news almost every day now, and it's, it's been a changing story, and we've got some, I think, some really interesting uh, tidbits and, and, and elements to share with you guys. After that, we're going to go through a three-step approach, uh, best practices to prevent ransomware from affecting your customers. Then we'll go through how you ameliorate the problem if one of your customers actually does get infected. And, and after that, we'll talk about how to identify the right solutions for your customers. Okay, so we'd like to open up with a poll, first of all. So we're really interested to uh, understand how many of you have had one or more of your clients infected by a ransomware. And so you'll need to respond to this uh, in the chat window so we can get kind of a general sense of uh, if this is something you're just hearing about or if you had to actually deal with this in your customer base. Folks, today use the chat window uh, to make the, oh, here we go. They're coming in under the question window, so that's fine. Uh, right now we have five yeses, uh, three noes, so it's uh, trending yes. Boy, I kind of feel like we'll have the poll of polls here. <laughs> There's some analogies here. Yeses are clearly winning. 
Chris, it's it's looking like uh, maybe two thirds yes, if not a little bit higher, and and then uh, no, and maybe and custom answers. And mostly yeses is what we would expect. Uh, it's already been uh, estimated that more than 50% of businesses in North America have been targeted by ransomware. And going right into our next section, the evolution of ransomware. You know, what are we? What are we looking at as far as where did it come from and how has it grown, what does it look like today, and, and where is it going? Uh, first, a little bit of history. Uh, ransomware isn't new. Ransomware has been around for you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, the big differences have been when we look at ransomware today, it's really the cryptocurrency that's enabled it to be so much easier to make money off of. So more people have entered the game because of the ease of the ROI and getting into this type of criminal activity uh, combined with uh, phishing. So phishing started in the early 2000s and it has become so popular, it's the most popular way to spread malware today. And these are some of the major reasons we're seeing it grow. Uh, it really started in 2015 and the alarming trends that we're seeing through 2016 are really because the worldwide reach, there are no borders, so anyone's susceptible. And they specifically started targeting businesses. So through 2015, it was just end users and as kind of a test bed, and then they got more sophisticated. And in their sophistication in targeting businesses, they started going after networks. And to kind of paint the picture of what we mean, uh, ransomware here is depicted by our little skull and crossbone, and then we have Mr. End User, you know, all of us. So through phishing or drive-by downloads, whatever it was, ransomware gets on the machine, starts doing work in the background, and then over time, the user either activates it by opening a file that has been encrypted already, or everything's been encrypted, and they get this message. They ask them for some money, or the user has to go and hope that they're doing their own backups. And that was when the average ransom was about $300. And in 2015, the total collection for the entire year was just over $300 million. Then you fast, then you fast forward into the first quarter of 2016, and they started targeting businesses and saying, hey, look, these users have access to a lot more valuable data. Let's look at their network and see what they're connected to. And from there, they would also look at, okay, what other users are they connected to? Maybe those users have better rights. And so by going across the network, it would find access to your critical applications, so your, your email servers, your web servers, your database servers, and also specifically your network backups. So doing things like deleting your volume shadow copies, uh, accessing network backups, and, and they target those specifically because they know that's the only option you have uh, other than paying the ransom. And once that happens, they trigger you again. Furthermore, you have really great productivity tools like Sync and Share. Everyone knows about these. You probably use maybe more than, more than one. Uh, they're targeting these Sync and Share tools because this, again, gives greater access uh, between networks. Now you're not network specific in your reach. So now this goes to other users who then have access to another network, another business, and the cycle repeats. So this is one of the things that has uh, really been kind of scary about the whole environment and why we're seeing figures like this. So as of September of 2016, ransomware collections in 2016 reached $1 billion. Uh, right now it's averaging about $133 million a month in new ransom payments. And it's accelerating at about $11.5 million per month. So each month it's still getting bigger and bigger. So it's not slowing down. And the reason for this is because it's working. Uh, what's even scarier than the amount of ransom money that's being collected is the amount of downtime. So the ransoms, you know, at about three to five thousand dollars on average nowadays, is really not going to be killing your business. It's the five days of downtime that it takes on average to get through ransomware. Whether that's because you had to pay the ransom and it took time to pay through the Bitcoin and get registered or because you had to go through a somewhat inadequate backup and recovery system. So once you get hit, you're really given these two options. You know, pay it out, feed the beast, or hopefully for the, the businesses that, are, that get hit by this stuff, they have a good system in place where they can actually recover back and recover everything they need. 
So to go next to it, uh, Chris is going to take us through kind of our three-pronged approach of what we suggest to combat this issue. All right. Thank you, Derek. So at this point, uh, we're in the situation where uh, uh, you know, it's happening all the time. Again, we, we hear about this in the news. There are steps that can be taken to minimize the opportunity for this to happen to your customers, and it's got a couple different elements. The first one is to make sure that you are doing um, some training specifically on this topic for your customers, and this is all the individual you know, doers inside the customers really about best practices, uh, you know, don't click on links in email, don't open attachments, you know, share with them some of the scenarios they're going to bump into. And the other thing that you can do with that is you can actually test your users by sending them these, these phishing emails. Um, and then audit the results and find out who's still foolishly, uh, you know, clicking away. So um, education is a key component to this uh, prevention. Uh, the second thing, and this is the piece that's actually been around for quite a while, which is the uh, the antivirus, and we'll we'll spend a little bit more time going into detail about this. But uh, there's there's different levels and types of antivirus protection that you can put in place, and you want to make sure that you've selected, you know, one of the better uh, flavors of this from a reputable vendor that's uh, maintained by their community uh, to keep the stuff out in the first place. But then the third thing there's really an acknowledgement that no, no antivirus protection is perfect. It's going to happen at some point, and you need to be prepared to, uh, to deal with the problem, and that's where the backup and disaster recovery solutions really come into play. Yeah, and the, the importance of the education and really of this talk is most people, when you hear about a new virus or phishing scams, a lot of people think, well, you know, I, I know better. I know how to identify something that looks wrong, you know, a funny URL on, uh, from the sender's address. Um, maybe you pay attention to some typos. They're asking for information they wouldn't normally ask for. Um, or you have, you have the antivirus in place or you have email filters. Uh, the phishing attacks and the you know, drive-by downloads and these things, uh, they can trick anyone these days. When an email gets hijacked versus spoofed, it's coming from the correct sender, but they've changed a URL in there. And that's not something that your filters are going to pick up on all the time. And it's certainly something that your users won't be as ready to accept. And so we have some examples here on the screen. Amazon was a big one. Uh, we have some that we've actually had customers receive from what look like internal notifications from a, a scanner. So you scan a document and you email it to yourself. It looks just like that. Uh, Apple recently was hit with this, you know, your Apple ID is about to expire, click here. Um, and you have a lot of other ways to go about it, and you have to really educate your users in how to react to this. Uh, one of the things that I've actually done personally um, with, with my wife and I is because we do a lot of Amazon shopping, and I said, just don't open any links from any emails you get from anyone. You know, log into the site that to the email and see if in their portal they have the message, and if they don't, then you can call them or just ignore it. Um, you know, it's you know, better safe than sorry. So when you go through well, the user Derek, education. Derek, if you don't mind, you can also use your Amazon Echo, my friend, and, and shop, by, <laughs> <laughs> shop by voice. But I, I, couldn't, I couldn't resist. Please continue. If you don't mind, I'm going to have a little fun with you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Amazon, order Derek a sense of humor. Get him to laugh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So with the user education, it's not just about simply doing a training. You know, everyone's been through that presentation where it seems like it's one year out the other, and as soon as you get out the door, somebody does exactly what you told them not to do. And so this is uh, one of the big value adds that as an MSP you can provide to your customers is a is an ongoing regimen of continual testing. You know, consider this a part of your network security, and it is because the entry point for ransomware is the end user. 97% uh, of phishing emails today contain ransomware. So phishing has almost completely switched. You might as well just call it ransomware phishing. Uh, the, and the way to go about it is set up trainings. You can hire third parties to do this. You can hire third parties to actually do the testing. So they'll actually come in and they will send out faux phishing emails to all the users in your organization. And you can see where, where things get in. 
And then you can follow up with another, another training and say, hey, so we did a test and we saw that these were the entry points and we want to talk about this. So this is a, a key component. And then again, people think, you know, why don't we have, you know, why isn't my antivirus enough? You know, I have this in place. And if you think about your, your network security, your front line, and then your internal security, things like your antivirus, things that are contain an issue, you know, it's good to think about those systems like your police force. Your police force is there to try to prevent things from happening, and if they do happen, they're there to also try to contain it. But you're not always going to contain everything, and eventually a building's going to get on fire, and that's when you call the fire department. And so these things work together, and they're important to have uh, next to each other. With our backup system, our fire department, we've actually built in some additional monitoring tools to help you identify and uh, try to get ahead of the game as far as things that are happening on your user systems that maybe shouldn't be. So when each backup runs on every device, over time we can see what's a typical type of backup. And for the most part, the rate of work that people do doesn't change so much over time. You know, you have you know, so many file changes and so many new files created, so many new files deleted, and we can see that there's an anomaly in this. Similar to how antivirus products will use uh, heuristics to identify anomalies in how certain applications are, memory, are accessing memory, and these types of behaviors. So these are really important things to kind of uh, think about when you're, when you're putting together a solution that will, will cover you best when you have so many open options. What's also important is to look at the ability to get back. You know, we talked about the incubation period, whether it's an incubation of infecting over so many users over time until that vulnerability presents itself and they get into your critical systems, or if it's one of the variants that slowly encrypts files in the background. Uh, if you can't recover to a point in time before your infection, then your recovery really isn't that adequate. And that's another that's another place that we see a lot of customers get in a problem. It wasn't that they didn't have a backup in place. It was that they didn't have the right backup in place. So here we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, your client's infected. Now what? And I'll let Chris uh, take us through this a little bit. And, you know, excuse, excuse me if, if you don't mind, um, uh, Derek, but uh, folks, be sure to use the questions uh, feature to uh, ask your questions. And shout out to uh, uh, Amari over in uh, Brazil. So thank you for joining us from Brazil today. Chris, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Harry. So, okay, at this point, someone in the network is infected, right? So what do we do about it? So the first thing you've got to do is isolate that machine and get it off the network before the thing goes any farther. Um, that's, that's probably the most important piece of all is to stop the spread, right? And you have to assume that um, once it's got an infected machine in the network, it's had an opportunity to spread it around. So you definitely want to look at all the machines in your network. But um, worst case, you just want to get that one off the network. Uh, the next thing you need to do, again, is you have to figure out when you got infected and, and go back to that point in time and, and restore the machine to where it was before the infection hit. Um, there are different tricks and techniques that you can do specifically with uh, resetting your BIOS time and things like that. Uh, but bottom line, you need to get the machine back to a state when it was pre-ransomware. And then you'll be able to, uh, at that point, recover your key files and uh, you've eliminated the malware from that particular machine. Uh, but the third thing is to be able to go back to that, that image, right? If you cannot go back in time to that previous image, you've lost whatever work has happened since the infection hit, at the very least, if not everything. So um, this is where the importance of a, of a backup and disaster recovery solution really can make a difference in terms of how bad the impact is of one of those infections. So I'm going to give this back to Derek here to go through these scenarios. All right, so as we mentioned, you know, with a backup system, uh, it's typically very targeted at at central systems and may be limited in its retention policies and may not at all look at um, the end users. And the recovery process is also a lot different. And, and what you see in traditional backup and even traditional DR systems, when a disaster happens, your downtime starts. Right? That's your ticker. Now you start losing money. So you come in and you look at your, 
your point, you identify, okay, this is the point we need to restore. So you, you have to provision some sort of hardware or place to restore it, right? You can't just do it in thin air. So you have prov a provisioning step. Then you need to figure out, okay, and verify this is the right place. And then when you find out that it's the right place, then you can run. Oftentimes, when you do that first re that first test restore, you're going to do it in an isolated, contained environment, so it doesn't so you don't you know release another beast out into the network. And if you find that it is infected, that's a lot of time to then wipe that machine and do another restore. So then you can then run when you finally find it. And this is you know a long process and take hours and days. With disaster recovery as a service uh, into a cloud, uh, if you have a true solution, you'll be able to get to those machines and boot them up immediately. You won't need hardware, you won't need to call anyone and ask them to prepare hardware for you. Uh, there shouldn't be any fee associated with it. You should just be able to run your machines. And if you can run your machines and even run them simultaneously, also in contained environments, you'll be able to very quickly end that downtime. And then you restore thereafter to a production environment, whether it's an existing or a new virtual host or if it's uh, physical hardware, you can take your time to do it properly because you've already ended the downtime ticker. And that's the important difference here. And we have this tale of two universities. We have the University of Calgary and University of Virginia. Uh, University of Calgary had been hit by ransomware about a month before the University of Virginia. And, and these techs um, talked a little bit. So when Calgary got hit, they didn't have the right systems in place. They couldn't do a recovery and they ended up having to pay out ransom to get their data back and they were down for a few days. Uh, fortunately, University of Virginia kind of got wind of this, you know, but they had already kind of put a draft system in place and when they got hit, it was from an example I shared earlier where it looked like a receipt from a scanned document from within the office. User hits it up and all of a sudden everyone's infected. So. Our Lady Ellen here gets the notice, opens up her central dashboard. Uh, she looks at the issue, identifies wh what kind of ransomware it was, finds out when it was infected, and then she just wipes out all the users' machines and restores back all their data. And total downtime was an hour and a half, and then they were fully, fully functional thereafter. And she said it was easy peasy. Uh, she actually she didn't break a sweat. And she lives a more comfortable life knowing that, you know, with ransomware out there, that's bad. But she knows at least if, if it does hit her again, uh, she's prepared and she's already been through it once, so it's not a big deal. So when you look at, so we went through the previous slide, you know, backup, and disaster recovery, and we talked about Ellen's example, and we also talked about antivirus and education. So with all these things, okay, great, we need it. How do we go about really selecting the right solutions? So we'll start off with, with antivirus. So the antivirus must-haves is one, it's got to be a multi-layered approach. Uh, so the multi-layered approach is not just a signature base, which is most of what your freeware will be. Your free antivirus will be almost purely signature based no matter who you get it from. And that's okay for existing things, but um, you know, there's a new virus created every couple of seconds, so you're never going to be up to date. And with something as damaging as ransomware, you want to make sure you have some more advanced uh, heuristics. So you want some container observation. So if you have emails come in with attachments or additional URLs, uh, it'll actually trigger a container. So you can open these things up, and if there is something bad in it, your antivirus program will actually keep it locked within a little box and then we'll throw it out, throw it out the window. Another important thing is crowdsourced intelligence and alerting. Um, basically what you have with antivirus programs is every user that's using their system is on the front lines of the battlefield. And so crowdsourced intelligence is just getting real-time feedback from the battlefield, from the front lines, back to central command, who will then put it back out to all the other people on the front lines. And this is really invaluable uh, type of speed of changing the policies, adding signatures, um, adding new heuristics and behaviors that could be damaging or could signal damaging behavior. And we do have a partner that does all this with AVG and we, we love working with them. 
So we recommend taking a look at their stuff. Uh, in addition to the multi-layered approach, look at smart and dynamic scanning. Things, again, that are going to look at the behaviors, how it's interacting with your system's memory. Uh, in addition, you got to make sure that they have the right decryption tools. So if you go with a provider and they don't have a solid site that gives you not only ransomware decryption tools or ransomware um, mitigation tools, uh, you're probably not in the right place. And that goes with all the other malware that's out there. You know, you want to find a solution that's also not going to slow down the machine. Uh, you know, the first way to get your software uninstalled by a user is to make it affect their performance. You know, they're going to complain, they're going to, they're going to do what they can to try to get around the, the locks you've put in place. And especially in a BYOD environment, you know, good luck. So you got to make sure that it's not going to slow productivity. And of course, alerting and management. You want people to know if, they're, if their scan hasn't run in a while, or if there's a new update they need to run, uh, or a way to push out an update if it's an important one, so you don't have to have the user intervention in there. And that's the general gist of what we recommend for the antivirus. I'll let Chris take us through the, the backup portion. Thanks, Derek. So, yeah, so everyone on this call, I'm sure, is doing some sort of form of backup, right? But it, the key is to make sure that you've got all of these various elements covered uh, because many, many point solution backup offerings don't do a lot of this stuff. So uh, when we talk about enterprise-grade solution, you're, you're looking for a way to be able to protect and backup um, any device that happens to be on the network. So this would be servers, virtual and physical, uh, it's going to be all the end devices, it's uh, mobile devices, anything that's going to be accessing the network needs to be covered. The second thing, and again, this is a fairly new innovation, is, is having a system in place that detects when uh, unusual behavior starts to occur on one or more devices. Uh, we showed you a screenshot of the one that we have, and one of the reasons that anomaly detection is so important is it helps you identify the, the point in time that you need to restore from to get back to the pre-ransomware moment. And that leads right into versioning. If you have unlimited versioning, you have a really granular set of backups and you can go back to the last clean one before the infection and minimize your loss of work or data. Um, endpoint protection, again, these are things that are off the network. They need some protection as well. And uh, we talk about file and folder backup because uh, you know a large amount of companies' data is on these individual machines and not necessarily stored on the servers. So you need to make sure you've got that covered. Uh, bare metal backup, if you need to wipe a machine completely and then restore a complete image, you'll need that flavor. We already talked about the devices and a little bit with the version and we talk about granular recovery points. You know, the smaller and more granular the delta is between these backups, the uh, less data you will lose in between. Um, fast recovery, we just talked about the difference between some slow traditional backups as opposed to the ability to virtualize a machine and, and fire that right up. And then multi-factor authentication is one way to make absolutely certain uh, that only the right people get access to these backups. Uh, interestingly, even backups are now targets uh, for a lot of the ransomware and things that are going on. Now on the drive side, this is a little bit different. It's not just traditional backup. You've got the um, ability to actually take a machine image that you've been backing up and then light it up in a virtual fashion. So if you've got a user who's got a problem with their machine or their server, you can fire that thing up and get right back online, and fix the problem in the background, and restore and get the machine fixed. And meanwhile, the user's productivity is not being impacted. Um, now, the second thing is kind of interesting. A lot of companies that offer virtualization solutions like this don't provide any sort of an SLA for how long it will take. Uh, I've been in this industry for quite a long time, and I've heard a lot of stories about people trying to, you know, light up a virtualized exchange server, for example, and it could take, like, hours for this thing to come up, and that's probably not the level of uh, recovery time that people are looking for. So. Uh, one of the things you want to ask about is can you get a guaranteed SLA for recovery time from your vendor, and if they're not willing to offer one, you may want to consider looking at a different vendor. Um, got to protect both the physical and virtual environments, particularly on the server side, so Windows and Unix, as well as Hyper-V and VMware, right? 
Uh, orchestration, this is a little more interesting. This is a case where you've got an entire network site that's gone and you want to light up multiple servers uh, in the cloud. Orchestration allows you to set up the sequence and timing for how they come up so that the boot sequence brings the entire environment up and they start playing nicely as quickly as possible. Um, unlimited testing and self-service declarations, these are kind of tied together. Again, a lot of vendors that offer uh, disaster recovery solutions charge for the ability to light things up in the cloud. And in many cases, you need to contact them to make that happen. So the two things you're looking for are the ability to do as many tests as you want without having to pay for them, and also the ability to light one of these up without having to contact the vendor. So self-service declaration is where you can go ahead and declare a disaster, whether it's real or simulated, and do that testing and light that stuff up right through a dashboard. And then finally, you're looking to make sure that you've got a secure uh, solution, one that is encrypting the data when it's in flight and at rest so that no one can hack that information. All right, we're going to go to another poll. And All this time right. the poll should be working. Oh, go ahead, Harry, yeah. take it. Yeah, I, I dug deep. Guys, I, I think I can do this. Um, let's see. Is that working? I, you know, I'm I'm pinch hitting today. Jenny's in Fort Lauderdale on her Azure 365 workshop. I think it's up. Correct, folks. Yeah, it's okay. up and running. All right, folks. Be sure to uh, to respond to that while you're doing that. By the way, bottom of the hour, very quickly, housekeeping. Uh, use the question feature to answer your questions. And yes, we're in Fort Lauderdale today headed to New York and Boston in two weeks, Texas election week, tour to cloud.com, tour to cloud.com. Be sure to join us. That's enough time to answer the questions, I think. Let's get back over here to the control panel. And let's try this. We have, uh, I'll read it off first, now then I'll close it, but we have 65% happy with our BDR solutions, 26% happy with our backup solutions and 9% not happy. Now let me close it and see if it reveals some answers. And I'm not sure that did. Did that, looks like we're back to the slide. So um, let's see, did we get that right? Da -da -da. Do you have, hang on a second. I updated the thing. I think that might have been an older poll. Is that right? Or did we? Yeah, I think that was an older one, Harry. Yeah, yeah, folks, we're going to have uh, uh, use the chat window. Let's go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sure quite what happened there. Folks, use the, uh, the chat window for either A, B, or C. A, B, or, or the question window for A, B, or C, and that's going to allow us a rough count. Let's do it again, if you don't mind, A, B, or C, and we'll get a kind of a quick, we have a lot of Bs, one C, a lot of Bs, B, 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 couple Cs, there we go. Okay, so it looks like the Bs have it. Um, there. We, oh yeah, yeah, the Bs totally have it, one or two A's. Okay, thank you folks for helping us out on that. Uh, okay, let's move on, Chris. All right, so uh, it, it, interestingly, B was the one that we get from uh, most folks when we talk to them about this, and, and just about everybody has got some pieces of this in place. Certainly, antivirus um, is deployed by just about everybody, and, and most folks have a backup, but one of the pieces that we find is that they, they didn't have all the elements of those two things, and beyond that, a lot of folks are not doing the education, so here's a a really visible value-added service that you can provide to your customers in bringing them that, that kind of structured training um, to make the complete offering. So, you know, B is the answer we were kind of expecting to see. Um, and thank you all for responding. All right. So, Derek, do I have control of the slides here? It'll probably be easier for me to just take it from here. All right. And... Oops. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> well, sorry, make me the presenter and then uh, I'll give you control. There you there go. go. Yeah, I'll just go. Uh, 
Do you have it? Presenter, you're just going to give me mouse and uh, keyboard control, and we'll be all set. There we go. Looks like it's working. Derek, you, sir, the presenter, if you want to go ahead and accept that important role. Looks like you did. Thank you. All right. All right. Did you give me mouse and keyboard control? He did. Hey. Or didn't he? I don't know. I can't tell. Took it away. Okay. I got it now. We can take it. Okay, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, so first of all, um, we want to go through the uh, the different use cases of the InfraScale solution. Just really briefly, uh, we have really tried to develop uh, a robust offering to really tackle all these different things that we've been discussing to make sure that you can protect your customers. And we've been doing this for quite a long time. We've got over 50,000 customers around the world. Uh, we sell this solution exclusively through our network of IT service providers and managed service providers around the, around the world. And we've got over a million devices under protection at this point, just to give you a sense of the scale of it all. Um, let me kind of break down the kind of two areas that we approach. So the first one, if you look at the data value pyramid, this is kind of the different areas within an IT network environment. We've talked quite a bit about endpoints, especially as the entry point for ransomware. Uh, you get remote offices, so you got people working from home or remote locations from headquarters. You get your core data center, and then you've got your mission critical applications. And traditionally speaking, uh, you know, the backup offerings, especially around DR, are, are focused around just the top two. It's really just those servers that are being protected in most cases. And frequently we find that those remote offices and, you know, the mobile users and the endpoints are exposed. And again, welcome to ransomware, right? So we've got two different offerings that are really designed to address those two areas, and we'll take a look at those. So the Cloud Backup product, this is a direct-to-cloud offering. This basically takes data directly from a device, whether it's a server, a workstation, a laptop, or a phone, a tablet, and uh, takes that data directly to the cloud. And so that works very, very well, especially for folks that are off on and off network. Uh, the disaster recovery solution is the more traditional BDR uh, style deployment where you've got an on-prem appliance that handles the local backup and also allows you local failover for that quick recovery. It also offsites the data to the cloud and you can fail over to the cloud. So that's the distinction between the two different offerings. We protect all different devices. Uh, we've mentioned several times why this is so important, but uh, between those two offerings, you can back up. Physical servers running Windows, Unix, Linux, virtual servers under Hyper-V or VMware. You've got your desktops and laptops, uh, Windows, Mac, uh, you name it there. And then the mobile devices, the tablets, uh, iPhones, and Droids. Uh, it covers all sorts of different operating systems. So I'm not going to read them all off to you, but we've got just about everything you can possibly imagine coverable uh, through the two solutions, so nothing is exposed. And then the last piece that's really kind of interesting, we've got a lot of different variations in terms of where that data can be sent. Uh, traditionally, folks have off-sited the data to our cloud, but we also have uh, many MSP partners that have stood up their own data centers, and they now send the backup data from all of their customers directly to their own cloud. Uh, additionally, you can do site-to-site, -site, so if you've got a hot site, you can do things that way. And then finally, and this is kind of the, one of the hot growing areas, especially uh, in the Microsoft community is you can send that stuff to a public cloud offering like Azure uh, or potentially Amazon or Google Cloud. So you've got a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, how you choose to deploy and you can send that data to just about any cloud. Chris? Um, yes, sir. I, I've got, yeah, I've got a few questions. If you don't mind, maybe to break up the, the cadence. Are you okay with a few questions at this point? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so let me scroll up. Bear with me, folks. Harry's in charge. Um, <laughs> uh, we have uh, the question was, any chance of getting a list of recommended antivirus and point security products? Um, chance if people reach out to you, a chance to get such a list? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, uh, does any AV software block or stop ransomware? 
I have used Hitman Pro Alert for this, but I have seen many AV programs that do not do anything to prevent the encryption. Interesting question. Yeah, <clears throat> Derek here. So the uh, so preventing the encryption and, and do AV programs uh, block or stop ransomware? I'll take those as separate questions. So first, does antivirus software block or stop ransomware? For the ones where there are known definitions, that it can. The problem is that the, the known definitions uh, changes more frequently than they're updated. So you're, you're always going to be behind. And again, it's kind of a, you know, a, a policing and a, a fire department kind of relationship with, with your security and your recovery and backup options. So does AV software holistically block a stop ransomware? No, it hasn't. And that's been one of the reasons it's been so successful. And it's one of the it's one of the reasons that you have security experts like Bruce Schneier, who will always come out and say, "Look, I've been telling you for this for the last 20 years, you need to have good backups in place. It's the single best thing you can do for your network security and for the security of your business." Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see. So let's go. Question. How does anomaly detection actually work? That, that's directed to Derek. How does anomaly detection actually work? Anomaly detection works by using some maths. So what we do is when we're, we're recording your backups, right? So we, we look at how many files you're being, are being protected over time. And we're looking at how many files are being modified, uh, moved around, removed from your machine. And the reason we do that is for reporting capabilities, so you can make sure that everything's protected. Uh, because we have this data, we're able to show a, a trend over time of what is typical behavior for a specific device. And like we said, you know, when you, when you look at, say, putting a server together, uh, generally, if you've had a customer for a while, you can kind of say, well, their data has a growth of about this over time. A lot of people say, you know, something like, you know, 10 gigs per user. Um, when you when you look at this behavior and more granularly, it's on a day-to-day -day basis and you know, an hour to hour. How many files does this device have newly added on it every hour, or how many on average, and how many uh, files are newly modified? And by having this information and knowing how ransomware works, and the way that ransomware works is that when it gets in your machine. When it starts activating and it's encrypting files, when it encrypts the files, most variants rename the file and it, it actually acts as a new file event on the system. So one of the behaviors users might notice is that if they try to launch a, say, a PowerPoint from, the, from within PowerPoint and they go to open, open recent, um, a PowerPoint says, oh, we can't find it. We don't know where this file is anymore. So then they navigate to the file location and it has a different name. They try to open it up, and then they get the ransomware notice. So when ransomware starts modifying and changing files in the background and the user's not doing it, what it looks like in the backup history is that all of a sudden you have a spike in activity. All of a sudden, you know, Harry's machine is modifying 100 files a day and adding, you know, 200. And we think, man, Harry is just a workhorse today. What kind of coffee did he drink? Uh, but really what's happening is that there's some sort of malware in the background making changes that the user's not aware of. And so we're, the anomaly detection is not a, a ransomware specific identifier. It's not going to tell you which version or variant has hit you. It's not going to say ransomware has hit your system. What it's going to say is, hey, something's wrong here. Uh, you have a, a really strange behavior that we haven't seen. Here are your logs. You should check out the files that we've been backing up and you can see which file, what the file names are. And fortunately for us, the ransomware uh, criminals do have somewhat of a sense of humor, and they usually use the file name as something cheeky like, haha, I got you, ransomware.txt or .php. And they use um, innocent extensions. So there were a lot of, there were a lot of files um, or a lot of AV attempts to say, okay, well, we'll just limit the, the type of file extension that can be on the system. Well, that doesn't work. And to follow up on the preventing encryption, the reason encryption doesn't work is because they use standard encryptions that are used by programs like us. Okie dokie. 
Um, boy, uh, uh, they're rolling in now. Um, <coughs> question. Oh, this is interesting. How do you differ from Datto? Well, you're not you're not in Connecticut, I'm assuming. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> We're not in Connecticut. Uh, Chris, do you like to take that, or do you want me to? I can take part of it. You can chip in more if you'd like. Uh, so we're, we're pretty different from Datto in that uh, we didn't get started as an appliance company. We're very cloud-centric. Uh, I think you probably gathered that. And um, we've actually, you know, introduced uh, some appliance components just for really performance reasons on the disaster recovery side. I think uh, one of the other things is that you know we got our start focused on this endpoint protection and cloud versioning and those sorts of things. So we've got a, a really robust uh, approach, uh, especially when it comes to endpoint protection in the ransomware world. Uh, Derek, any other comments on that you might want to chip in? Yeah. Uh, we protect physical as well as virtual environments. And when we say we protect virtual environments, we mean at a, at a host level and even a super host. So if you have multiple virtual hosts, uh, you can just connect in our, our system right at that level, and then it will show you what, what's beneath it. So it's a much more streamlined relationship. You can recover new VMs directly to existing or new, or new virtual hosts. Uh, we offer an SLA for recovery, so 15 minutes guaranteed, part of our, part of our contract with you. And we have a pretty awesome partner program, and we think it's the best in the market. Very cool. Hey, let's do that. We do have some more questions, but let's, Chris, let's let's get through the uh, your presentation, and then, uh, folks, we we will get to everybody's question. So, so questions, Chris, go ahead. Awesome. Now we're very nearly at the end, uh, but one of the things that uh, we did want to bring up in particular was some of the things around uh, compliance. Uh, so these, these, these medallions are, are really, really important in certain verticals. Uh, obviously, everyone is familiar with HIPAA in the healthcare world. Um, we are part of a HIPAA compliant solution. Uh, the data centers are all SSA 16 certified. Uh, this is the son of SAS 70, if you guys remember that. Uh, but they have gone through the audit uh, and testing for security processes. Um, we've got a variety of other ones, but the other ones I wanted to point out, are the one that has actually been more and more uh, interesting to the market is the CGIS compliance. So this is for basically police departments and other, other areas within law enforcement, and they're only allowed to off-site their data to CGIS compliant data centers. And this has been a real need in the market, so if any of your customers our state and local government, our local police stations, or sheriff's departments, uh, they're really restricted in terms of where they can send their data. And so most backup offerings um, don't work for them because the data can only go to a CGIS compliant data center. Uh, we have partnered with a, uh, we have a strategic partner who is called CGIS Solutions who has a CGIS compliant data center. And as a result, we now have a fair number of these uh, law enforcement agencies are able to offsite their data. And so if you've got anyone that looks like that and you've been looking for a solution, I, I recommend that you take a look at that. Okay, we've got uh, one last poll uh, before we go to just uh, leave it wide open to Q&A. So, uh, Terry? Yeah, let's, well, let's use the question feature. I'm just not, I'm, I'm having a bad poll day. <laughs> <laughs> so let's use the question feature. Folks, we'll get a rough reading on, on your sentiments. If you could just type in the letter A or the letter B, and let me go find that myself. It fell behind a window. There we go. A or B, please, folks. A or B. Let me scroll down. Or, yeah, and to, and to be clear, those of you that well, they're uh, typing in, yes, they're, they're typing in. Hang on a second. Yep, lots of A's and B's. Uh, and just to be clear, the folks that, that do respond with A, uh, we're happy to follow up with you, and we can really dig in and and talk through, you know, how to address these three prong strategy to cover your customers, including um, going back to the question that came up about recommended uh, antivirus solutions and things like that as well. 
Perfect. Okay. And thanks for bearing with us. Um, okay, Chris, continue or please advise. Please advise where we're at, my friend. Well, basically, that's it for the content. Uh, what we'd love to do is continue the Q&A. I'd like to remind you again that uh, the folks that ask the most and most compelling questions will be up for um, a, uh, a prize at the end for uh, whoever asked the most interesting questions and things like that. So we'll go through and some will be awarded a PlayStation, a uh, uh, Apple TV, or a drone. So ask away. Get those questions in there. There we go. Uh, okay, so I'm back on duty. Here we go. Does your a disaster recovery as a service, or I guess what, DRAS <laughs> solution protect you against small server failures or just big site-wide, i.e. natural disasters? Great question, and it's one of the points we usually make when we're going through uh, the the importance of being able to protect what we refer to as micro disasters is just as, if not more important than your macro level disasters. Uh, statistically, the the risk of experiencing a, a fire or flood, um, especially depending on your region, is much lower than experiencing what you what is quite common, like hardware failure, user error. Uh, these types of things occur for most of the damages. In fact, 55% of downtime in North America is usually ca is caused by hardware issues. So uh, we consider that to be a very important part of our platform, and we don't license or make complex the ability to do that. Uh, we, in our system, it's really the difference of you right-click a machine, and you can explore to then search or browse for a specific file, folder, or application that you can recover to, or recover, uh, or you can right click and boot. Okay, uh, question. I presume you store our clients' data in your data centers. Where are your data centers located and how many do you have? All right, we have seven data centers we use for customer backup, and we have, I don't know how many um, privately set up data centers uh, with our back end in it that we have uh, specific, uh, specific partners using for their customers. Uh, data centers that we have as default InfraScale locations are in the US, which we have three of. We have them in Canada, we have them in the UK, Germany, South Africa, and Australia. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to, again, point out, also, uh, we've got folks that are sending stuff to Amazon and Azure from all around the world. That's right. And we're even, and some of our bigger uh, customers, we even have data centers in the Caymans, and, you know, we're really all over the place. Um, you know, we're a software-first company, and we didn't want to push hardware on people. We're not here to sell you boxes. We're really about the, the service of getting your business up and running. Okay, uh, next question. Has, uh, it, has InfraScale actually helped a partner or in customer recover from a ransomware infection? Many. Um, and the ones that have had our system in place before, uh, we end up doing a case study with, which uh, was actually the tale of two universities. Um, the nice IT manager, Ellen, was actually one of our customers and since then has gotten uh, immediate approval to buy four additional boxes for four additional locations on campus. And those of you who deal with education uh, know how hard it is to make quick decisions in that environment. And her ability to get through that event with absolutely no harm, considering they just saw what the University of Calgary went through, uh, was really terrific. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay. Uh, to, to, to. How does your DRAS solution actually work? Derek, I think that's one for you. How does it actually work? Okay, so the DRAS solution is a is an appliance based system. So it's what you're what you're familiar with with appliance DR systems. The difference is that you do have the option to use a virtual appliance on your own hardware. Uh, you put it on your network. So anything on your network can be can be protected to this primary appliance. 
from the primary appliance, you can set up to replicate to the InfraScale cloud, or you can replicate to a secondary paired appliance in a different location. Uh, again, uh, we went through the, com the compliance that we have, and we do have a lot of customers that have high security needs, and sometimes going to our cloud is not an option. So they do a point-to-point -point connection with, with in their own locations, or they have specific data centers that they're already approved for, and they don't want to go through another RFP to find another data center, so we let them set up there. And the way it works is you select the backups or the machines you want to have backed up. You set the schedule. You set the retention policy, both for the primary appliance, and then the replication just kind of happens over time. Uh, with our deduplication technology, uh, we actually save a lot of bandwidth and time in the replication process because we're actually replicating during the transit as well, which is something that's unique to us. So we're actually sending a lot more than you would get with any other system that's out there, uh, which means that you have a faster okay. replication time, faster time to back up, and that's terrific. Okay, uh, next question, um, and we have about three minutes left, so we've got to just kind of run along here. Uh, I've never heard of InfraScale. Uh, what type of validation is that you're legit? I, yeah, I thought you won some awards or something. Chris? Oh, got to unmute there. Uh, yeah, actually, we uh, were recognized by Gartner in a couple different ways. We were one of Gartner's cool cloud products in 2015. Uh, we are in the the Gardner Disaster Recovery as a Service Magic Quadrant now as a visionary. Uh, the company's been around for quite a while. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we've got over 50,000 customers using this solution, and we're protecting over a million devices. So, um, And we're happy to put you in touch with other uh, MSPs and partners that are currently using the solution. They can tell you about their experience with the product. Okay, uh, two more questions, folks, and we'll call it good because we are at the top of the hour. We always respect that. Does the appliant also back up workstations, or do you sell a combination of appliances for the server and direct to cloud for workstations? So for a mixed environment, it's typically both. Uh, the appliance is normally deployed primarily for the backup of uh, local servers, uh, although you can actually deploy a virtual appliance, which is, uh, you know, in a Hyper-V or VMware environment and run it right there on the server. Uh, the endpoints are typically backed up uh, direct to cloud, so no appliance for those. Okay, final question today, folks, and then we'll announce the winner. Uh, do you have an InfraScale appliance or can you use your own hardware? I think that's for Derek. Both. Your choice. There you have it. Okay. Uh, Chuck uh, Pittish is the winner uh, for the prizes, so he'll be contacted by our good friends at Team InfraScale. Um, folks, I want to thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, the individuals, uh, Derek and Chris from InfraScale. Um, thank you for joining us. By the way, where are you guys located today? You're down in California. Are you down in California today? <laughs> Well, we are distributed. Derek is actually calling in from his home in Germany, uh, and I am here in the Bay Area. The company is headquartered uh, down in the Los Angeles area. There you go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, perfect. So thank you very much for uh, stopping by to chat with our community today. Folks, um, as you uh, know, that, that we'll be back next week with our weekly webinar, and then in two weeks, uh, it's New York and Boston for Tour to Cloud. That's at tourtocloud.com, followed by election week in November for three cities in Texas, so Austin, Dallas, in Houston. Uh, boy, howdy, that's going to be a fun week So for so many reasons. But um, enjoy the ride, and uh, uh, fingers crossed that we survive the big storm hitting Seattle. Have a great day. Thank you very much, folks.